Hi everyone, today is a very special episode. Today we have one of the youngest female partner in one of the oldest VC firm. Uh, she has been Forbes 30 under 30 venture capitalist, a founding member of Microsoft's VC fund, currently a partner at 51 year old Mayfield Fund. She's working very closely with Melinda Gates Pivotal Ventures to provide capital access for underserved female entrepreneurs. She focuses on leading early stage Series A and B investments in the enterprise software space with a particular fondness for businesses that is leveraging machine learning, predictive analytics to unlock new intelligence in legacy stores. Welcome to SheBC. I'm your founder and host, Guy Teresa Park. So today is an amazing day that we have Priya Sai Prasad with us. She's a partner at 51-year-old Maple Fund. Welcome to SheBC, Priya. Thank you so much for having me here, Guy3. And, and again, I'm really honored to be here and also really excited to see the work that you're doing to help amplify women's voices, especially in this type of an industry. Thank you so much. I think I am so excited to have you. As I said, you're one of the youngest partner in one of the oldest fund and the amazing work that you have done. I mean, um, from being the founding member of Microsoft's independent VC fund to being a partner at Mayfield, it's one of the prestigious Silicon Valley VC fund and you're just 31. And you, you, know, you have been recognized in Forbes 30 under 30. And for interesting thing about you is that you live in 12 different countries before you turned 12. And I think I would love to know how that shaped your growth mindset. And let's talk about that amazing journey. Yeah, yeah, no, no, happy to. Um, so I was actually born in Chennai in South India. And when I was two months old, we moved to Nigeria and Africa. And so I lived there for about five years. And then we just moved from country to country after that as a family. And so, um, there were certain countries that we actually lived in just for a month and sometimes it would even be three weeks. Wow. So it was, it was quite an exhilarating journey. You know, looking back on it now, it seems really exciting because, you know, especially if you have the travel bug, but back then, you know, as a kid, when you're entirely new in a country, you're learning all the different customs and traditions and you're trying to meet your new best, best friend and make these sort of friendships, it was quite hard every time you're ripped away from one place to another. And so it was, um, looking back on it, it was actually kind of a blessing in disguise because I, I sort of learned this ability to become extremely resilient. And anytime I I meet a new person, I tend to empathize a lot from their perspective. And, and it's very easy to, for me to connect with a variety of different type of people. So I almost like joking, I almost don't have that inherent sort of bias filter that wow. I can only connect with this type of an entrepreneur or this type of an entrepreneur. Um, I can pretty much connect with anyone and sort of empathize with anyone. So that's, that's come in really handy over time. And another way it's also come in handy is, um, I think when you're when you're sort of looking at a entirely new geography that you're moving to, you're sort of recreating yourself in, in every space. And so you're recreating yourself from nothing, really. And that's kind of an entrepreneur's journey. If you think about it, they're building something out of nothing and their odds are stacked against them and they're taking on this huge risk. So it's just such an admirable thing that that I really connect with. And I'm drawn to entrepreneurs who sort of understand that failure is more common than success in entrepreneurship and they sort of take that head on and they go for it still that's there's nothing more admirable than that for me that's amazing I, we definitely talk about failures you know in early stage startups but i would love to first talk about your investments you have invested in some amazing companies in the element ai go one schedule workboard bonsai uh, which were acquired by uh, Microsoft. So can you please share some of the learnings and your investment thesis? Would love to know about it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So so it's interesting. So I, I typically invested a lot in sort of seed through Series B investments. Um, Element AI was a seed work board and um, Workboard and Bonsai were both Series A and Go One and Schedulo were more on the Series B side. And so what's really interesting that all of these companies actually had in common is the 
founding team and, and the founders in general were fantastic. And it's so interesting that over time, you know, as VCs, we come up with all different things that you can diligence when you're looking at an investment opportunity, right? You look at the market, you look at the competition, you look at what the true differentiation here is, what's the value proposition, what do the customers think, why now in this market, all of those questions. And then you, of course, have the founding team. Turns out the, the way you almost scale that, it should be 95% the founding team, in my opinion, and 5% for all these other sort of categories. Because the reality is markets are so hard to time, right? Think about the companies that that were going after sort of the travel and tourism sector mm -hmm. that, that were really overfunded last year and we're seeing so much momentum. They could not have predicted this massive pandemic, right? Absolutely. And so... So what happens when, when you have these sort of adverse conditions that the market presents you with? And markets always go through cycles as well. And so if you invest in the right type of entrepreneur who's hungry, driven, passionate about the pain point they're solving, they know how to sort of go through that resilience and, and adapt to the change and know how to pivot and know how to sort of really learn from, from short-term failures and really be able to augment the business in the right way. And so that's kind of the, the collateral learning from those investments. And um, your second question is sort of investment trends and themes, yes. right? So I tend to focus a lot in the enterprise side of the house and a lot more on the application layer side of things. Mm -hmm. But um, for me, what's really interesting is future of, the, of work is kind of the most buzzy phrase mm -hmm. that people are using right now, right? And Especially I, I actually- Especially work. <laughs> <laughs> oh, exactly, exactly. And because of this entirely new sort of hybrid, remote, distributed environment that COVID mm. has sort of slapped people into. Um, but I, I sort of almost looked at this theme almost two or three years ago, actually during the beginning of my time at M12. And- Fundamentally, my, my concept was that nine to five as we know it and going into work mm. is going to change so much for so many different reasons, but it's going to change and work-life balance is going to tr turn into work-life integration, mm. right? So the, those were sort of the, the top two um, macro themes that I was looking at. And now, of course, that's turned into such a reality, right? And I think in this new sort of environment where your home is essentially become your office right and even when we even when the covid um vaccines are discovered and and whatnot i still don't think we'll be going back to where the world was before covid um i think we'll be in this sort of hybrid environment where maybe you'll go into work about one to two days a week mm -hmm. and then maybe you'll work from your home the remaining days of the week there's going to be sort of this this um a fluid environment. And so what actually happens to the entire tech stack when you've got so many people outside the firewalls of your company trying to be productive and, and trying to add value, and you as a manager are trying to make sure that your employees are actually doing work, right? So there's, there's so many different um, behavioral changes that are going to happen, but that's going to happen across the tech stack. And so what we're seeing now is, um, you know, Satya Nadella is very famous for saying that we've seen two Two months worth of innovation or two years worth of innovation in just the last two months alone in terms of old school industries that are adopting digital transformation and the rate at which they're adopting digital transformation. Um, they're doing that because they have no other choice but to do that because most things are now virtual, right? And so um, what, what does that actually mean for the entire tech stack in terms of cloud compute and in terms of having a powerful enough infrastructure and intelligence at the edge such that this type of a distributed workforce can be supported, right? And at the application layer, what does this mean for for every type of line of business employee in terms of ensuring that they're productive, ensuring that they have an entire IT system to, to make sure that there's no sort of breakage or failure that's happening over time, and to ensure that they're still happy and they're still um, excited to perform on a regular basis when there isn't that in-person sort of connectivity. Mm -hmm. In an entirely digital world, how do we bring a sense of authenticity? And I think there's a whole new set of applications that can be created to address that. And that's what keeps me really excited. 
That's amazing. I think you kind of answered my next question, but I would love to know <laughs> about, you know, since we started talking about future of work and as you said, like venture capital is all about identifying patterns and time. And you were starting to identify that at when you were at Microsoft, like how the work-life integration is going to happen. And, you know, so when you look at this future of work and the startups that you're looking at, like how the startups are going to shape the future of work, especially when the crisis is gonna get over? Because do you think we are gonna go back to normal? Like there's a new work-life integration is gonna come, but what's your take and how do you think the investors are gonna look after the crisis is over? Are they gonna be like, oh, okay, we'll go back to our normal investment thesis or do you think there will be a change of investment thesis that's gonna come out of it? Yeah, no, it's a great question. I think there's, it's the latter. I think there's going to be a massive change of um, investment theses and investment focus. And the reason for that is this, this sort of societal change that we're going to right going through right now, where everyone's sort of working from home, you can, you can basically hire a developer or a business person in any geography right now and onboard them. Um, It doesn't have to even be within, within your country let alone your city, right? And so this sort of rapid progress is actually going to fundamentally change the entire stack, right? Mm -hmm. And so I I don't actually think we can go back to before because if you look at some of the statistics that are being published about people working from home and whether that's working or not, turns out it's way, people prefer it way more than their lives before because the amount of efficiency that you're able to get from this when you don't have to commute an hour to work, an hour back from work, when you don't have to sort of waste yourself in sort of meeting fatigue over and over again, and people are so much more efficient. So how do you take that efficiency and blend it with you know, that sort of culture and um, water cooler talk Mm. and and the ability to really have that sort of in-person experience in this digital front, it it requires reinvention to the very core. And I think there's so much opportunity here for new companies to be built and for existing companies that are looking for new avenues of growth, there's a lot of opportunity as well over there. So I think our society hasn't seen this kind of a fundamental behavior shift in decades. And so that has to fundamentally change any investor's perspective on sort of what themes they're going after. Absolutely. I love what you said that the water cooler talk, maybe we need to start that water cooler talk in the Zoom. During the starting of our um, discussion, you talked about failures, you know, and venture capital has parallel distributed return and many early stage startups, they fail. And failure is a learning, but no one has said that, you know, as a specific target, you know, in their businesses. So what does it take for an early stage startup to build a mentality for a very strong exit in years to come and to avoid failing badly? Yeah, you know, it's a great question because I have sort of a contrarian view for it where I think in order for any startup to truly succeed and to truly see greatness in whatever industry they're in, you really as a CEO and a founder really have to embrace the fact that you are going to fail. (laughs) I think once you embrace the fact that failure is a reality of this entire ecosystem, right? And in your startup itself, the journey is never a straight linear path to success. Even if you look at the most successful unicorn companies that, that have been built over time, right? It's a path that looks somewhat like this, right? And so there's going to be many failures. There's going to be different types of disappointments that come your way. Maybe you mm. extend an offer to mm. a VP of sales that you've been so excited about and they end up going with someone else or there are just so many different natures of failure That's over true. time. And so once you actually embrace reality and say, you know, I'm going to fail, but, but I'm so driven and I'm so determined that I'm going to learn from my failures along the way. I'm going to surround myself by an incredible set of VC partners who who can add value to me and who I can learn from and who they can learn from. And so as long as you surround yourself by the right support system and have the mentality that you're consistently learning from those mistakes, Mm. um, that's really, in my opinion, the path to success. So when I said earlier that, you know, we, we invest in, at Mayfield, we love um, saying that we invest in people first and markets next. And so that's what we almost are looking for in the entrepreneur, where it's an entrepreneur who has this continuous learning mindset, yet has 
it yet is so driven towards um, achieving excellence. And at the same time, it's, it's actually like a crazy combo. And at the same time, they're really passionate about the pain point that they're trying to solve. And they understand what the customer truly needs. Um, it's that sort of magical combination that makes sort of the really great founders. That's amazing. And you talked about investing in people first. And you have done some amazing works with underserved female entrepreneurs. And when you had been at M12's female founders competition that helped launch to make capital access easier for underserved female entrepreneurs. And now you're working with this one of the oldest VC fund and, you know, venture capital we have seen that has not been disrupted so much. People like Melinda Gates um, and others who are trying to bring that change. And now at Mayfield, you have joined forces with uh, M12 and Melinda Gates Pivotal Ventures to complete the second year of this competition. So I would love to know people like you who's bringing movement into this industry and you being a catalyst of change, how do you look the future to be in the venture capital industry? Yeah, no, this is a great question. And it's also near and dear to my heart because I've, I've happened to, for whatever reason, chosen a career where I tend to often, more often than not, be the only woman in a room or one of very few women in the room, right? And so it's, it's one of those things where if you don't see potential versions of yourself in the future in any room, it can be rather discouraging, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so I want to fundamentally change that. But, but taking a step back, you know, what you were talking about, why has venture capital historically generated such, such a set of biases and, mm. and not really opened up so much access to capital to others? I actually don't think it's fundamental in that anyone wants to necessarily like any VC wants to not fund women or not fund folks from certain yeah. minority groups, right? I think it's because the, the whole job of venture capital is to basically return a lot of money to LPs, right? Make make solid returns and make your mm. LPs happy. And and you've got these funds that have been doing that for years and years, mm. starting with the 1950s, 60s, you know, Mayfield's a 51-year-old fund, right? And they've been doing that over time. And the one phrase that's used very often in BC is pattern recognition, right? Mm. So you look at what's worked for your investments in the past and you look at what's worked for your fund's investments mm. in the past. And then you, you try to draw parallels to that and you try to look to replicate the successes you've had in your past, in your future, because that ensures that you have a great return for your LPs going forward. But what that does is it completely constrains your pipeline because mm. you repeatedly only look after entrepreneurs in your network mm. and you typically search for certain attributes and traits in entrepreneurs that are the type that you funded previously. Mm. So there's no real inherent room for growth that's being built into that, right? And so VC firms have to increasingly be not just measured based on the incredible returns that they generate. Of course, that's why we're all in business and that's what's keeping us in business, but they should also be measured by the amount of diverse thoughts that they're funding. And if that's actually a milestone that you're measured by, then it will fundamentally change the way VC firms operate, right? And so that's that's kind of what I want to advocate for. And this female founders competition that we launched at M12, and now we're partnering with um, with Melinda Gates's Pivotal Ventures and M12 from Mayfield. It's fantastic because it's proven the point that this is not a pipeline problem. We got almost a thousand applications <laughs> from all over the world from incredible women entrepreneurs. And it, I can tell you being on the judging committee, it was so hard to narrow down these incredible founders. So there's talent that's out there and there's talent that's coming from entirely different geographies, entirely different um, backgrounds that you wouldn't even normally think of in, in your existing Silicon Valley network, right? Especially when, you, when you're so used to going to certain type of schools, when you all grow up in certain types of ways, yeah. your network tends to be pretty closed. And so it's not a pipeline problem, but to incentivize firms to go out there and actually source proactively outbound deals from all aspects of the world with founders of completely different backgrounds, 
you, you almost need to put an emphasis. LPs need to start putting an emphasis yeah. on not just returns, but returns plus um, having a diverse portfolio and mm. having a diverse perspective of solutions that are being invented. So, so I think that that's sort of my perspective. So well said. I feel like I have asked this question to so many VCs, but I think I got the best answer. I mean, I, I love the way <laughs> how you said, like, you need to, you need to have a very intellectual diversity of thoughts and try to have like, you know, not the same, don't, don't do the same thing again and again. And obviously we are very return driven. And I definitely want to ask this question, like, Mayfield is one of the oldest fund and you have a very diverse investment team and we have not seen that in other funds which are so old. I mean, how do you look at diversity in the cap tables and especially your engagement with your portfolios? No, it's a great question. Diversity construction, I, I think now DNI, diversity and inclusion, is such a buzzword. Every yeah. company is talking about it, right? And it so, is becoming a status quo. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, exactly. And whenever someone hires someone who's a minority in some way, they tend to publish it, they tend to talk about it. And so, what we're starting to see is sort of two camps. One, the set of folks who understand the definition of diversity and understand the benefits of diversity of thought, right? Mm -hmm. And then camp number two is, I just need diversity. I have five white men in this room and I need to supplement it with um, women or underrepresented minorities, right? Other underrepresented minorities. And so um, that's the wrong approach, right? Yeah. To just hire someone just because they, they meet the quota. The reason that's, that's not great is one, it doesn't feel great for that person to, to know that this is why they were hired. Mm -hmm. And two, you're not progressive enough to understand the benefit that this person is going to bring to your team, right? But if you take the flips, um, hiring a team that looks like a bunch of folks from different race, different genders is an outcome. It's mm -hmm. not the beginning part of solving for that outcome. How you solve for that outcome is by understanding the benefit that diversity can add to your team. So what's the benefit? If you have five people who come from the same background, they all went to call it Stanford or Harvard, your typical networks, right? And they all grew up in, in a certain type of affluent household, right? They tend to think in similar manners. Mm. And with business, you want to make sure that you have your blind spots covered mm. and you have people who really question you. If you say you want to launch this particular product in this market, you want someone across the table to say, actually, this may not work because of X, Y, Z, right? But if you have five people who think the exact same way, you're inherently not going to achieve the best outcome that you possibly can. It may be a decent outcome, yeah. but it's not going to be the best outcome that you could have accomplished if you put together a more diverse team, right? And so because of that, diversity of thought is so important. Mm. But how you get diversity of thought is by hiring people from entirely different backgrounds than yourself, which could end up manifesting in not five white men in a room, right? <laughs> <laughs> and so, so it's almost like, how you solve for diverse teams is very important than just solving for the outcome of what those diverse teams should look like in the end. That's so, the advice that we give portfolio companies. I love that. I love that answer. It brings me to my last question. I cannot believe that time runs out so fast. As you said, like the work-life integration, we live in a very different time. And, you know, I have a 21-month-old baby. You have Gandalf. And <laughs> how, how do you prepare your work-life balance, and especially in this new remote-first environment? And my question is twofold, but because I'm a Bengali, I love food, and you love visiting <laughs> restaurants. So how are you keeping up with good food, especially in this time? <laughs> Okay, this is guy three, your best question yet. <laughs> um, no, it's, it's such a good question because this entire new norm, you know, it, it's almost like a fallacy that's being created where you're so efficient, you're hyper-focused all the time, you're able to get stuff done in different pockets of the day that you weren't able to before. Like if you have kids, you're able to get things done when your kids are sleeping and yeah. you've got this almost, um, almost, uh, you're working at all parts mm. of the day, right? Yeah. So how do you actually integrate in some semblance of a personal life in there such that you don't turn into this machine over time and there's and and you don't get burned out, right? Mm. And so, I mean, VCs are are notorious for working hard as well. Um, 
And so it's usually a very 24 seven business. You work around the clock serving yeah. your entrepreneurs and helping them, right? So in this environment that's heightened so much that there's, there's the lines, there's no blurry lines anymore. There is just work, <laughs> right? So I think um, that work-life integration point that I was talking about, which is understanding that for each person that looks fundamentally mm. different, um, with you and your 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 baby, it's going to look fundamentally different than me and Gandalf, right? <laughs> and so my my hours during the day will be fundamentally different mm -hmm. from your hours, my way of working style. And so I think this new form of leadership that we're going to see over the next decade is going to be about understanding the personalization of those mm -hmm. styles, being wow. open yeah. to it, and realizing that when someone gets the freedom to be able to work in the capacity that suits their personal life and their, mm -hmm. their sort of lifestyle the best, they're yeah. going to deliver the best outcomes, right? Yes. And so, so being open to that versus historically, 10 years ago or so, you know, you'd have that nine to five. If you don't see someone at nine, 9 a.m. directly at work, you just assume that they're not working, right? <laughs> it's, it's a fundamentally sort of different mindset. Mm. I really do think that it's going to be such a personal work approach for each person and what works for them. And that's just going to drive better outcomes for businesses. Yeah. So how are you managing with the food? <laughs> oh, yes, yes. I didn't even get to the favorite part of the question. Yes. Um, so, so it's funny. I'm a, an active foodie and I love eating at new restaurants, trying out the latest new restaurant, but I don't cook myself. <laughs> and so I'm just an avid taster of other people's food. And so this COVID, this COVID timeframe has really make, made me take a step back and actually think about cooking. So oh. I've started to, yeah, yeah, which is really interesting. I mean, I'm by no means good, but I've started exploring the cooking frontiers. Mm. And so my husband and I now, now are starting to cook together. It's usually him cooking and me watching, but, <laughs> but I'm, I'm getting in there. So that's sort of how I've been combating and, um, and doing a lot of takeouts has, has also been great to support the local restaurants because I, I really don't want to imagine a world where so many of these restaurants go entirely out of business in this COVID timeframe. Yeah, true. I, I love talking to you. I think you brought so much of great insights in the future of work and also, you know, venture capital is not a career, it's a lifestyle and obviously our, our love for food. I'm so excited to have you here, Priya. Thanks a lot for your time. Of course, it was such a pleasure. Thank you so much for having me, Gayatri. 